I was a Wall Street guy turned entrepreneur almost 15 years ago, uh, started a, a, an investment advisory firm to bring the math and data oriented risk management we had on the street to the small investors that didn't have access to it. So we got Mark on today from Tolerisk, a uh, new episode of the One Podcast. Um, I think this is going to be interesting for people who are in SaaS, fintech, um, you know, financial services industry in general. He's had a long career there um, with the entrepreneurial sort of career starting at the 2008 kind of bust, which is like, Mark, a, a pattern for a lot of founders that we talk to, um, interestingly enough. Um, but for the stage, the audience of kind of early stage entrepreneurs, do you want to kind of just give like a little bit of background as to yourself, maybe 30, 60 seconds, just on who you are, what you're doing currently? Yeah, I was a Wall Street guy turned entrepreneur almost 15 years ago, uh, started a, a, an investment advisory firm to bring the math and data oriented risk management we had on the street to the small investors that didn't have access to it, ended up developing some pretty interesting IP around helping clients choose the right risk directive and have a, a process that evolved with them really mathematically, scientifically. And uh, that ended up uh, taking off. Uh, clients loved it. And uh, ultimately, uh, we ended up spinning out the intellectual property and starting a software company, which is Tolerisk. Now we serve nice. advisors all over, all over the country and, and designed specifically for fiduciary caliber advisors. Cool. So I want to get into Tolerisk you know, in a little more detail, but I guess just you know, even before that, um, were you always someone who sort of thought of yourself as an entrepreneur or, or did you always have this inkling to go out on your own, start your own company? Or was that something that kind of came up later on? I think, I think I always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I was the kid who figured out how to, you know, sell candy and toys at school. I, you know, I, I figured I could, uh, I, w I was not a great tennis player, but I, I learned quickly that if I, if I had offered group tennis lessons uh, and I charged less per per kid, I, I could end up making a lot more money per hour. And so I, I think I always had that mindset. I was probably too chicken to start a business uh, as a young adult. And so I ended up on a corporate career track, but, uh, but ultimately found myself uh, back in the entrepreneurial kind of vein. Nice. Um, so walk me through, I guess, what, what were you doing in, in 2008? Like what was your kind of career like before you started the first company? Yeah, I was working at Citigroup. I managed about a hundred billion of Citi's balance sheet, maybe a little more than that at times. Uh, mainly fixed income and derivatives uh, was uh, my main focus. I had a team of portfolio managers and traders and whatnot that that made that possible. Uh, and in two thousand eight, frankly, my old backup plan, if if things didn't work out at Citi, was walk up the street to J.P. Morgan or Bank of America and kind of. Tell them I'm I'm available, and uh, in 2008, as as I'm sure you remember, that that wasn't realistic for anybody. Yeah, and uh, I, I put together a business model really as a Plan C, if you will. I backup. asked, it was a backup to the backup, and I backup asked, I asked everybody that would talk to me what bothered them about whatever they were doing for their personal investments. And I found there were common themes. Now, keep in mind the timing I'm asking these questions. This was on the heels of Bernie Madoff, uh, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns headed under. And, and sure. so the, the fears that people had were pretty prevalent. We found a lot of people told me they were worried about being the victim of the next Madoff. And even if they weren't quite that fearful, they were concerned that their advisor didn't have their interests uh, aligned with, with their own. Uh, so kind of conflicts of interest kind of theme. Also needs for liquidity and transparency. They wanted to understand what they really had. And a lot of people at that time were starting to discover maybe they didn't know uh, or that what they had wasn't really liquidatable for what was marked in their statement. And so these, these were the things that were pervasive. So I felt like at the time, my my business plan was to pull the best features from other business models, cobble them together, and address the key themes, the key concerns that people had. And that that was my fundamental strategy for putting together a business. And I I contrast that a little bit with what I saw some peers do who fancied entrepreneurship, where they started with the question of what's my ideal job? And then they built a Got business it. around their ideal job. 
I think if I had done that at the time, I probably would have started a hedge fund. But what I quickly figured out was at least at, at that point in time, the world didn't seem to need another hedge fund. And so yeah. I went about it very, very differently. Cool. So I guess starting that business, you know, obviously you, there was some kind of fore planning, I guess, before you began. But <clears throat> what, were, what are the first like 90 days to a year looking like? Did you already have an existing book of business that you could kind of utilize to get those first clients or what was? No, yeah. I no, I, I had only managed city's balance sheet or piece of city's balance sheet. So I know I had no clients. So this was really starting from scratch. I put together a basically an email distribution list announcing yeah, a newsletter the form pretty much just announcing the formation of the business and uh, i don't know if i was just starry eyed i don't uh, sometimes i look back and think how on earth did i have the courage to do it um maybe i was lucky but i found people responded so no there really there weren't any existing clients uh it was really all starting from scratch and I was fortunate that that people responded to the business model, and I, and I guess I had you know I had a good reputation professionally, and so people started to raise their hand and say I I need help. This is what I need, and that's how it just kind of grew organically and a lot of word of mouth. So I guess what a, in that in those first couple of years doing it word of mouth, I guess what are the you know what are the biggest challenges that you're facing compared to today. I think day one, you always have to ask yourself, am I spending money based on the workload I have or the revenue that I have? And of course, day one, you have no revenue. And so, yeah. okay, so you can't, you can't do it based on the revenue. You, you have to obviously come to any new business with some capital. And so I, I was fortunate I had some capital to put into the business and some capital to live on, you know, while I built the business. But I, I think for me, I ended up sort of shooting someplace in the middle and even not just day one, but even the first couple of years where you want to accomplish more, you want us, you want resources, you want technology, you want people, you know? And, uh, so I, I probably had enough courage to, to keep putting money into the business so I could build something that was more scalable. Uh, but maybe with some guardrails, with some limitations. Got it. Um, at what point, I guess, so this is a service business, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's all kind of, you. Um, are you thinking about like scaling it at any point hires, you know, expanding it beyond kind of like, yeah, I mean, I, I started business. hiring, I started hiring within the first year, not, not nice. day one, but, but within 12 months. Um, yeah, my, my feeling was I needed to put the right technology in place so that it would be scalable. And I think some of that comes from having a corporate background where I had an enormous budget for technology. Of course, I didn't have that uh, personally, but I think that was the mindset is that you have to build out the infrastructure, you have to build out the, uh, the technology so that you have something to scale. I could have made the business profitable earlier on a smaller scale or without the same ability to scale, but I wanted something that was going to be more scalable than that. Got it. Um, so what, did you ever have like experience in software or tech no. technology? Just as a user. No, no, right. no experience managing any kind of technology projects, technologists, no developers, nothing like that. So, yeah, so that, keep going. Sorry. No, I, I was going to say it was a lot of learning through bruises, you know, yeah. but Tolerisk was really necessity was the mother of invention type story, mm. you know? we didn't have a good solution, couldn't find a good solution to help people choose the right risk directive and have something that would evolve with them. What I found advisors did, this was 2009 by the time I started the firm, but what I found advisors did were these very basic quizzes, the RTQ, the risk tolerance quiz. You could find them for free online. Very few people paid for them. So they were, were like lead magnets. Yeah, they, well, no, they weren't, they weren't lead magnets back then at all. No, I think that's something like that came around resource. years later. They were, they were checklist items. They were, I did something. I asked you these questions. You're moderate. I put it in the folder. That's how advisors use these things. And they'd been like that for decades. And most of the questions, they were very brief, seven to 12 questions. They were very brief. Most of the questions were personality and they would ratchet up or down the output based on the time frame until retirement or the age. 
or both. And they were very basic. Advisors didn't put any credence in them and nor did their clients probably relate it. So no, they weren't, they weren't used at all at that time as, as kind of lead generators because nobody really put any, saw any value in them. Uh, I was shocked that this process completely ignored the client's financial data. Yeah. To me, that was a pretty big miss. I, early in my career, back in the mid nineties, I worked at the Federal Reserve. I was in, in supervision regulation, focused on capital markets. And this was also at a time when personal computing power was really picking up. And even in a professional setting, you were starting to see um, simulation modeling at banks and bank holding companies. And so this was a, a big focus of mine back early in my, my career. And the Fed had asked me to develop a half day course to teach bank examiners about Monte Carlo simulation modeling. And I knew very little. I mean, I knew just enough to be dangerous. Uh, so I kind of had to teach myself about it and, and put together enough in a four hour uh, kind of crash course to be able to teach them what they needed to know when, when they, they kind of went into these banks and bank holding companies. So that, that was some of the early kind of exposure that I had to, uh, to that type of process. But in, in any case, when when I was trying to figure out a solution to this problem, one of the first things I thought of was, what are we supposed to be doing? You know, as a former regulator myself, I thought maybe I should see what the SEC tells us we're supposed to be doing. And I was surprised that there wasn't any mandate. There wasn't a lot of guidance. They did talk about risk tolerance and they talked about it in the context of someone's willingness to accept risk and their ability to take risk. And that actually resonated with me. Those, those two dimensions made a lot of sense to me. And so my interpretation of that is that someone's willingness is a function of personality. How much are you willing to accept? Their ability, their financial ability, I thought was a function of their cash flows, their, their expenditures relative to their resources and how far out in time it is. Right? If somebody's going to use all their money tomorrow, then you can conceptually see they don't have any ability to take risk. If they're not touching their money for decades, then you would think they probably have a maximum ability to take risk. And so as I thought it through, I ended up realizing that we could look at this problem the way we look at a bond or a bond portfolio. And that was an area I had a lot of experience in. So rather than model bonds or bond portfolios where you can measure sensitivity to changes in interest rates or credit spreads, I thought we were, we're really trying to look at the series of household cash flows like a complex bond, right? The client starts with principal. They have often irregular intervals for inflows and outflows across more than one tax status. So it's more complex, but in essence, it's, it's the same. And, and so it was about figuring out what is the paradigm? What's the X axis, if you will? It wasn't just interest rates or credit spreads or something like that. We had to think in terms of how we were going to communicate risk to clients. What made the most sense to me, what I saw other advisors do was a stocks to bonds benchmark. So a 100 would be a total stock market risk level. And 90 would be 90% in the total stock market and 10% in the total bond market. And that would have a little bit less risk. And so by defining that sort of industry standard scale, we could now apply the same kind of mathematics with a very high probability of uh, uh, you know, high confidence interval, if you will, and measure objectively someone's financial ability to take risk. And by measuring it in that way, we could also measure how it would evolve over time. And so there were these, these features that would kind of evolve as we, as we developed this. And my, my wife actually helped with the other dimension. My wife's a um, psychologist, her doctorate. She's a certified behaviorist. So with little guidance, we conducted a psychometric study. So that's a, that's a psychological that's profile. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a psychological profile. We didn't invent it, by the way, just, just to be yeah. clear. It's been done for decades and, and, and measures different elements of personality. So you may have seen things even as a, a consumer, or your, your viewers have, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic are you? How introverted or extroverted are you kind of thing? It, it's comparing your responses to a series of questions to a population who's taken the same exam. In this case, we needed to figure out how risk seeking to risk averse someone was. And again, in all candor, we weren't the first ones to use a psychometric profile, even in that use case. The, the most unique thing about our approach and tolerance was this second dimension, which is let's use their cash flows, let's use their finances 
and measure their actual financial ability. But to my knowledge, this was the first two-dimensional approach to risk tolerance. And, and I haven't, we've seen a few others try to follow, but we've never seen anybody with the same kind of scientific mathematical rigor or things like that. But anyway, early on, what I built was just a big spreadsheet. It wasn't called Tyler Risk. I had no aspirations of building software or something commercial. It was just a big math model. And um, one of my young colleagues took my Excel model and turned it into a little desktop app. And we loaded on everybody's computers, added a colorful chart. And over the next couple of years, we found that clients raved about it. And they kept saying, I've never seen anything like this. And boy, this is helpful. And so one day the light bulb kind of went off for me. And that was, maybe there's a need for this in the industry. And at the time it was very much a side project. I wasn't really sure if it was going to have legs. I wasn't sure if I was just going to have an expensive toy that only we were going to have or, or, or whether there would really be demand for this. But I spun out the intellectual property, hired a development team, uh, no real experience with that. That was, that led to a lot of mistakes too. I, I didn't know how to vet a development team to hire properly. And I didn't have any sense about the excruciating detail that needed to be documented to properly develop something like this. I just had no mm -hmm. idea. And so what was supposed to be a couple of months ended up being a couple of years. And, uh, and it was a painful process. Ultimately got to that first kind of beta 1.0 version in the cloud and dismissed the development team because they were terrible. Uh, by that point, had at least a little bit more experience, enough to be able to hire a team that was better. Gotcha. And I learned a few things about myself in the process. Okay. I learned that I love technology. It was like an artistic expression for me. You know, I... I've always sort of seen numbers and statistics a little differently than most people. I couldn't paint you a picture or sculpt you an obelisk or anything like that if my life depended on it. But this was a way of, of making math and numbers and statistics visual and getting those aha moments from people, helping people understand complex topics much more easily. That was really gratifying. It was really exciting for me. And I loved it. I also like had so. my, it was, it was. So it took us a long time to get that beta 1.0 version up in the cloud. So given that I had all these other ideas for how to make this thing much better. So versions two and three and four were kind of mocked up on a napkin. And by this point, my first business had become a success. So I had a little extra pocket change and some new inspiration. And so I just kind of kept funding it and developing. Anyway, um, ultimately, um, started giving it away, getting feedback from other advisors. They had great ideas too on how to continue to make it better and, and um, decided one day to offer it up for sale, meaning would somebody license this? And found that people would, they'd, they'd pay money to actually use this thing, which was pretty, uh, pretty cool too. Kind of kept going with it, just kind of kept developing and making it better and better based on both internal ideas as well as feedback from now a few new users. And, mm -hmm. and we started to get some attention, started to get some accolades and, and started to land some integration partners and things like that. And, and things started to really pivot, I think around 2021, we appeared in the big annual survey of advisor technology, and we were a standout. We've actually beaten the two large players in our space now three years running and, and by a pretty healthy margin in the, the recent survey. And we've, we've, we've scored integrations with Schwab and Pershing and Investment Money Guide and uh, Orion, Black Diamond, Red Tail. A lot of the, if you have folks that are, are in the wealth space, these are, these are household names that they, uh, they would know. And we have a long queue of others that are actually in, in coming too that I'm really excited about. So it's just, it just kind of gradually uh, 
taken on a, a life of its own. And, and so we've continued to develop. We have, I don't know, 65, 67 releases under our belts. The site looks completely different than when we started. And, you know, we've brought on people that are really experts in design. We brought on a marketing team because I have no business managing a marketing function. I discovered this as well. Uh, I hired a consultant to design our sales process. He was an expert in B2B nice. software sales. Uh, not my background either. Okay. Now he, he didn't have expertise specifically in financial services or financial technology. So I was kind of his subject matter expert to develop the content for the sales program. But let me tell you, I went through his sales training as sort of part of this exercise. It was eye opening for me. I had never been through anything like it. I didn't have a background in sales, just these fundamental changes to how I was approaching software sales were eye opening. I, if I if I shared them with you, you you, you might even laugh a Blow little bit mind. at how I used, how I used to do it before. But it's uh, it it, it was it it changed. It just changed my perspective. And I'll tell you something else, just conceptually. To me, as a very math and sciencey finance kind of guy, I viewed marketing and sales as more or less kind of a foo foo science. You know, I I don't I. I didn't have an appropriate appreciation for how scientific the process can and should be. And that's also what I, I learned. Uh, so that was a little humbling, I think, too, uh, and an important, important lesson to realize. So anyway, lo lots of lessons learned along the way. I know I'm probably off on way off on a tangent versus your question, but uh, hopefully that gives you a little, little sense for those, yeah. those people with us. Yeah. I mean, is there anything, I guess, building you know, like a SaaS company? I mean, you mentioned this, you were doing sales <clears> in a weird way, but I think, you know, I know a lot of people who are not technical people. They're not like involved in the SaaS niche, but they might have like a, another niche that they're experts in, like, you know, financial services, et cetera, but they want to start a software company. So like, I guess, do you see, if you could go back in time, would you have rather, you know, kind of like networked more and, and figured out that type of stuff? You know, it's funny. I thought, I thought I was being smart by getting three referrals for the first software team. I got one, and we're, we're located outside of Philadelphia in Southern New Jersey. I had one near us in South Jersey, one across the river in Philly and one in New York, which is not, you know, not that far from us. So I thought that made sense. Your point about networking, right? So sure. the team in New York gave me a range of cost for the initial build that was so wide. It was like from X to three X. And I thought, how on earth can I sign up for this? I have no idea what I'm getting into. The team in Philly said, we need to see your code in order to give you a quote. And I felt like, well, that's, that's the proprietary sauce here. You know, you, you're going to look at our, our math and our code. Like that's, that's everything. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not letting you guys into that. We haven't even decided for hiring you yet. And so it was a, it was a non-starter. The guys in Jersey, I knew one of the partners, he was not the technical partner, but I had some comfort. They gave us a fixed price. It was a little more than I was expecting, but it was a fixed price and I knew what I was getting into. And so we did it because I had no mechanism to evaluate the technical expertise. I didn't realize that these guys way oversold themselves. They were in way over their heads. So I think in hindsight, what I needed was some type of trusted resource that had technical skills to help me hire, even if they weren't going to be the ones doing it. I needed to surround myself with, with somebody that knew how to hire those people because I did not. And so that was, that was probably mistake number one. And it, it made for a lengthier, more costly, more stressful process. I used to literally wake up in the middle of the night thinking that when the new development team, which we, we had plans of hiring a new development team for a while, it took a long time to get to that first deliverable. And I felt like I needed that before I transitioned to, to the next team. But I would wake up in the middle of the night with this, this bad dream that the new guys were going to actually get in there and call me up and say, listen, dude, this thing's held together with toothpicks and bubble gum. Just start over. I, I, that would literally keep me up at night. Thankfully, when they got in there, I think they said, it's not that bad. And that was pretty darn good compared to what I was expecting at the time. I'll, I'll tell you something else that was a bit of a revelation. As we were getting to that point, 
of, of launching that first beta version for a long time leading up to that, that it felt like we were getting so close to the finish line, but not quite there. Well, at some point, probably within a couple of weeks of, of launching that, I just had this revelation that this wasn't the finish line. This was the starting gate. And th that was also kind of a humbling realization. You know, we were getting close to launching the very first beta version. How I thought that was the finish line, I have no idea. But that's how it felt for the first couple of years. And, and, and I, 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 I came to that epiphany that that just was, couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I, one curiosity I kind of had was, I guess, did you, in terms of the te the actual technology itself, like outside of anything you were doing with the industry or the psychographic stuff, did you ever feel the need to like double down and kind of like go further with it? Um, you know, you talked about like the, some of the team members who have been with you for a long time, but like, are, have you ever thought about expanding it, I guess, as a business? Well, we've been doing that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I didn't hire anybody at Tolerus really till a year and a half ago, you know, uh, it, like I said, things started to feel different about 2021, but, but, uh, yeah, so that, that was the pivot point to say, you know what, uh, this is, this is the time to really, uh, expand. I put in an advisory board. I started hiring some people. I hired a marketing agency. Uh, we landed an enterprise that left, you know, our big competitor because our solution was better and, and it was catered towards fiduciaries, which is, which is becoming such an important part of this, the retail financial services marketplace. It's more and more advisors are, are becoming held to fiduciary standard or they're doing more and more of their business as fiduciaries. So this was, this was a great fit for what they, what they wanted. And we found that those on the front line adopted it for business development reasons. They wanted to impress prospects because that's who became clients. They wanted to deepen confidence with clients because that's who exhibited the best retention. They made the fewest behavioral mistakes and they were also the ones that made the referrals. Most advisors would tell us that 10 to 15%, I'm sorry, 80 to 90% of their referrals came from 10 to 15% of their clients. And that's probably not that different than what I, I had experienced at my, my first company by improving client engagement by driving up confidence in the process more people make referrals and so it really helps accelerate the practice growth the other types of folks that come to us at tolerus were people in some type of governance oversight compliance type role they wanted a process that was objective repeatable documentable you know they wanted consistency from not only one client to the next uh, one year to the next, but even consistency from one advisor to the next. That was the way they exude that fiduciary duty of care, that kind of culture of compliance. That was a big, big driver. Small firms, sometimes the, the sole proprietor is wearing both hats, you know? So that, that's who we found were our persona from a, from a sales perspective. That's who, that's who wanted Tolerisk, and that's, that's who we primarily sell to. Somebody interested in one or both of those. Have you always been, um, have you been, uh, doing, I guess the sales yourself the whole time? Like how do we you hired sales at this point? Yeah, we have hired salespeople too. We're, I, I think as we've grown, we, we're also sort of rethink, reevaluate what our needs are. Uh, initially we kind of combined what two roles that I think most companies would have separate. Usually in a sales function, we find there's some salespeople whose job it is to get the lead through the door, book the meeting, kind of schedule the meeting, and then somebody else who is performing the sale and making the close and things like that. Initially, I tried to kind of smoosh these two jobs together, thinking, how many people am I going to hire at once here? I think in hindsight, the reason other bigger firms keep it separated is the same reason that we ultimately decided to separate it too. They don't have to be the same people. It's not the same function. There are lots of ways to fill that pipeline. We found through general marketing, we get a lot more traffic to the website and people that, that um, uh, schedule sales calls, advertisements, call center. I mean, 
we had lots of ways of filling the top of the funnel. And so separating out, finding the best closer, right, as separated from the person who has to fill the, the slots, you know, we don't, we don't need to try to find some generalist who's going to do both. So you, I, you have know, to separate those functions. I, I think that, I think there's a reason other, two other separate skill sets, you know, so ex exactly right. I think there's a reason others do that. And I think, you know, uh, I, I think what I learned is I, it, it's probably best not trying to reinvent some of these wheels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, how about Mark? How do you, you, how have you thought about marketing? I mean, obviously it's kind of like a, not a niche that's like heavy on marketing content, like ads and that type of thing, but have you yeah, thought about that at all? Yeah. So ultimately I concluded sometime early last year that I really didn't have any business running the marketing function. Just again, wasn't my background. Sure. And I, I outsourced it. We had one of our board members actually was CMO of, of a couple of really large advisor technology firms, and she ended up launching her own agency. And so I outsourced it to her team. And they've, they've felt uh, like Got an it. internal extension, and they do a much better job than I could have done managing that function. So it's, it's social media, it's email marketing, it's, uh, you know, it's advertisements, it's some PR, uh, and you know, things, General like, stuff. things like that. Yeah. 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 It's a variety. Got it. What's the next kind of, what are the next move? I mean, you were talking about the growth in the past year and a half or changes. <clears throat> what are like the next big moves for you? Yeah. So it's expanding sales. It's expanding marketing. It's, it's continuing to reinvest in the business. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're exploring raising capital, uh, which I haven't done yet. And I didn't do it at the first business either. I'm, and um, I appreciate that I had the ability to do that. Uh, that's what that's what a, a Wall Street career allowed me to start. But the, the capital needed to do this with much bigger scale is is bigger than what one person can really kind of just fund along the way. And so my one of my frustrations is that there are things we're not doing as fast as I would like. We land integration partners faster than we can develop them and deploy them. And, and it actually, we end up holding back on some of those marketing and sales efforts because of that. And that's a frustration. So I, I think the capital raise allows us to do some of the things that we're doing now faster. Yeah. And that's- Just accelerate that's that stuff. Yeah. And that's, that's appealing. And you wouldn't have thought about the fundraising like, you know, five years ago or something due to- just to change the business or? Yeah, I, I really didn't five years ago. I started kicking around the idea uh, a couple years ago, but I think when you're choosing investors, it, you're kind of getting into bed and you got to choose your partner wisely. Yeah. And I think for us, some of the traditional investors aren't the right fit. I think for us, I want investors, if we're going to raise capital, if we're going to take on other shareholders, partners, I think our best investors are going to be folks with industry experience who not only quickly appreciate our innovation, but also can add more value than just the check they write. Some, for your founders that are contemplating raising capital, sure, give a lot of thought to the kinds of investors that you're seeking. There are lots of early stage VCs which will uh, look for you to show them the billion dollar exit. That's what gets them excited. And they know that it's the only one or two, them. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the only thing, yeah. They know that one or two of their investments pay for the other 18 or 19. Yeah. And that's and that's fine. That's a fine business model for them. They will back the winners. They will shy away from the losers. You will likely be deploying their capital very rapidly because that's how you're going to substantiate the top line growth you told them you'd have to support the billion dollar exit you told them you were going to deliver. And so that means you're going to do the second round of fundraising on the heels and you're probably not that far off from thinking about your third capital raise too. I think this is okay if this jibes with your goals. If you are swinging for the fences and you see the 100x outcome and, and great, more power to you. For me, maybe, maybe it's my own tolerance score, but for me, I want a much higher probability 
of the 10 or 20 X outcome, which to me is great. And I don't need the hundred X outcome. So I think that's one of the things if I can share thoughts with your entrepreneur listeners is give a lot of thought to who your investor partner is, what their goals are, what do you give up? Not just in equity, but what do you give up in any, any uh, control, any impediments, any requirements? Think about whether their goals are aligned with yours and make sure you choose investors that are, uh, that, that really align with your own goals. We've, we have found lots of investors that are interested uh, in this and, and line up much better. Uh, they appreciate that we're very capital efficient. They don't want us to just go and spray capital around knowing that we're going to do a second fundraising and a third. Uh, they prefer that we are strategic about how we deploy capital and that we're looking for the right places. We're very analytical, as you can imagine. So we're, we're measuring where we get the biggest return on that capital and so that we can allocate resources in the best, most efficient ways. And so for me, finding the right investors, that, that can take time. And I think it's fortunately for us, we don't need capital. So it wasn't a must have, but it's definitely what I want to do. It's really about though, securing the right investors for us right now. And that's Got what it. I would encourage your listeners to think about. Got it. Um, Mark, tying everything together, any advice that you have for the entrepreneurs out there who might've been in a similar position and are looking to take the dive, I guess, and start their first company. Maybe they've been in a career for you know, a couple <clears> decades and they just want to you know, start a business. What, what kind of advice do you have for them? Yeah, I think you really need three fundamental things. You need an idea for some type of goods or services. You need to have the ability to execute or, or surround yourself with people that have the ability to execute. And you need the capital to see it to fruition. Now, I don't think the idea has to be life-changing. I don't think it has to be brilliant. It has to be an idea to produce some goods or services at a price that people are willing to pay that not only cover your cost of producing those goods or services, but also compensate you for the capital that you risk and the time you spend. So I think it has to be a sound idea. I don't think it has to be a you know, an earth shattering idea. The expertise to deliver, it's, it's pretty, or to execute, it's, it's important. Again, you can supplement your own expertise. And I think I lacked some of that in the beginning. I think for me, I viewed it as a side project in the beginning. And so I probably didn't give it all the seriousness it needed at the first early stages. I didn't go and get the resources to, to complement where I was clearly deficient. So I would say, if this, is, if this is your business, if this is serious, make sure that you supplement the areas where you're, you're deficient so that you truly have the ability to execute that from the beginning. And then the capital, I was fortunate I had that, but you wanna make sure you have enough capital to see you through to fruition. You could have a fantastic idea, you could be a wonderful operator and, and be able to execute, but if you run out of capital, it's not gonna matter. So I, I think you got to make sure you have all three of those things before you do it. I'll also share, there's another concept, and I don't remember who originated it, but it's called the Lean Startup. Uh, yep. I, I imagine some of your folks have come across this before. I didn't do it, uh, but conceptually, I, I like it. It's sometimes emotionally hard in that it's really an acknowledgement that when you have that first idea, that you should go into it assuming it has a 20% success rate and an 80% failure rate, which is probably relatively typical. And your goal isn't success. Your short-term goal is to figure out, is this idea in the 20% or in the 80% and figure it out really quickly and really cheaply. And, and the, the notion possible, that, yeah. yeah, the notion that if you do that, you can, repeat that several times, that you only need one successful idea. And so if you can repeat that several times, your odds of finding one that's in the 20% go up significantly. And I, I, think it's a, I think it's a useful concept. I'm not saying it's for everybody, and it is hard. It is hard to make that definitive judgment call and abandon a business because you're still not certain. You might 
think it's in the 80% as opposed to the 20% success, but are you sure? You know, it, it, it is hard to walk away from that. So I, I know that's an easier said than done concept, but I do think it's worth at least exploring. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say on the general topic, and, and I'm sure it's one you've heard before too, which is fail fast forward. You know, it's not just the lean startup fail fast and, and move on to the next one, but learn from it. Each yeah. time you go about it, your skills and ability to, to evaluate and execute and deliver should be getting better. Yeah. Anyway, just my two cents. Cool. Anyway, Mark, where can people find you if they're, they, you know, they want to work with you or get, you know, talk to you more? How do they get in touch? Yeah. Um, well, tolerance.com, if they're interested in, in us, uh, they can reach me. Uh, if they just want me personally, I'll, I'll give you my email, mark at tolerance.com, and that, that'll reach me. They're welcome to reach out and connect on LinkedIn uh, as well. And uh, yeah, happy to happy to chat. And if I can if I can help or help network or help uh, save somebody some of the some of the mistakes I've made along the way, I'm happy to do nice. that. Nice, nice. And uh, what's it like being married to a psychologist? My life is a case study. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, it's it's uh, it's it's great. Uh, my wife and my my I have two daughters too. They are awesome. Um, I, I couldn't do any of this without my wife. In truth, you, you, you have to feel supported as an entrepreneur. It's not, I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship as, as evidenced by starting two companies, but it's not for everybody. It does get glamorized. And so you need to be realistic with yourself. You need to kind of remove the, the rose colored glasses, so to speak, and, and make sure this is really a path you want. My, my next door neighbor was a serial entrepreneur long before I was, his wife once said something like, great. You started a business for the flexibility. You can work any 80 hours a week you choose. Yeah. And there's, there is great something line. to that. You know, uh, you, yeah. you think things like, you know, you're going to be your own boss, but then you realize you have dozens or hundreds or thousands of bosses. Those are your customers, you know, right. and, and it's not that you don't have a boss. And if you're leaving corporate America, you know, for me, I took for granted all the resources. I had an accounting team and a procurement team and an IT team and a legal team and whatever I needed, I picked up the phone and somebody did it. And guess what? I didn't have to write a check for it either. Yeah. The company paid for all that stuff. When you go into business for yourself, you either got to do it, learn it or hire out for it. And that can be expensive. And, and yeah. so there was definitely some appreciation of my life in corporate America that I didn't fully have when I was there. That's got it. probably worth noting. Cool. Mark, thanks for coming on. This is the one podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Cool. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Uh, now I'm basically starting a new company, which is going to be an app marketing.